From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is to the best of my knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier, and tonight we'll talk about music appreciation. You don't have to play an instrument or have a beautiful singing voice to appreciate music. By learning some basic facts, you can become a more knowledgeable and discerning listener. Tonight, we'll discuss the fundamentals of music. We'll also take your phone calls at 1-800-543-8242. You can also email your questions to response at psu.edu. Now let's meet our guests. Professor Kim Cook has been a member of Penn State's School of Music since 1991 and has performed to critical acclaim as a cellist in 26 countries. This year, she serves as the inaugural Penn State Laureate. Greg Woodbridge is a music director and conductor of the Central Pennsylvania Symphony. He holds undergraduate degrees in piano performance and music education and a master's degree in orchestral conducting from Penn State. I want to thank you both very much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Greg, let, let's start with you. What makes for a wonderful piece of music? How do, how do you judge it? Well, Dr. Spanier, I think the, the easiest way to define such a, a difficult and broad question is to say it's really up to the individual listener and it's what they glean from the piece. What I consider to be a great piece of music, um, a Mahler symphony, a Beethoven symphony, um, or even a piece by Aretha Franklin, uh, somebody else would have their own definition of what a great piece of music is. And I think that it, it comes down to um, what moves them emotionally. But th that sounds like such a diplomatic answer. <laughs> Kim, <laughs> Tell me about it a little more technically. Is it is it pacing? Is it uh, something in the emotion with which it's played? Or is it the kind of uh, music that just ends up being popular for some reason with a lot of people? Well, I think it, it's any piece of music that moves you emotionally, just like what Greg said. But um, and, and it can be many different things. But uh, the music that has been passed down and that has uh, been able to uh, face the scrutiny of all the performers, the, the uh, historians, and also the audiences, uh, m much of that music is emotionally effective. And so um, I think when you go to a concert, you just want to be open to the music and not try to um, decide what what's going on and I mean it's always helpful to understand more about the music but if you just let it affect you in the way mm -hmm. that it's played and uh, just relax I think that it's um, you know you you can really be moved by different pieces of music. We hear about different uh, periods of music or styles maybe like Baroque, classical, romantic, uh, does it have to do with the period in which that music was written and first performed, or does it mean more than that? Uh, no, I think it means more than that, because there, there are great pieces of music in each of those periods. The, the, the periods are just designated time periods, and um, they define certain styles and characteristics, but um, the fact that the music can can move you um, is that's that can be universal. I think people are fascinated to know about conducting because mm -hmm. what we see a conductor do, someone like me who doesn't understand the nuances of this, mm -hmm. we see you up on the stage in front of the orchestra with the baton or mm -hmm. just maybe just your hand sometimes and you're making gestures and it looks like you're kind of in charge and they're following what you're doing but I know there's a lot more behind being a conductor. Tell us what the job is and all of the different parts of it. Well the the job of being a conductor starts a long time before you even meet your orchestra for the first rehearsal for the concert series and the conductor's job is to assimilate uh, everybody's part so that uh, he or she has a, a a concept um, of the entire work and, and it, it starts with something as basic as tempo 
how fast is the orchestra going to have to play this piece. Uh, it starts with um, where do we need to slow down or take time so that we can sort of regroup and get on our way again. It's also a matter of helping the players to reinforce uh, when are they supposed to be playing their part and when do they make their entrances. Um, some percussionists will sit out for many, many minutes and hundreds of measures of music before they have to come in with a very loud cymbal crash. And it's very helpful to know that they have a friend who's going to say, yep, it's time to go, and there's their cue. <laughs> so all of that work happens, like I said before, the first rehearsal. The rehearsal process is simply uh, guiding those players to put that piece together in that way. And the conductor is the person who sort of unifies the interpretation. Um, so making all of those decisions ahead of time and saying to the, the players, uh, this is kind of how we're going to do this uh, for this performance of the piece. And usually it's within uh, certain parameters. And as the rehearsal process goes along, um, it becomes more of a job of reinforcing the, the decisions that were made mm -hmm. and encouraging the players and, and hopefully inspiring the players. Play their best. Kim, uh, you were the first Penn State laureate and have done a masterful job this year of educating thousands of people about the nuances of, of music. And uh, I know along the way you and I have spoken and I would ask you these dumb questions and then you would make that the subject of your <laughs> next column. And one of the things that I never knew, you know, everybody comes out on stage and they're all tuning up their instruments. I never knew how in that seeming chaos they're figuring it out. And you explained which instrument it was that they were actually tuning to and how they went about doing it. Could you explain that? That's right. The first instrument that you hear is going to be the oboe. And the oboe is uh, tuning to an A, which is 440 hertz. And uh, the, they we use the oboe because it has more of a penetrating sound and it's easy to tune to in each section. So the oboe will play maybe three or four A's um, for each of the sections. They'll play for the woodwinds first, usually, and then the brass, mm -hmm. and then they'll do for the strings. Mm -hmm. I always like it if they give two for the strings, one for the <laughs> upper and one for the lower strings, because that helps the bass and cello uh, section really get in tune. Uh -huh. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's basically the way it works. Except it's not that same number of hertz in some places. You that's, right, yeah. that's right. That's uh, right. It's 440 hertz. That's a standardized measure. Uh -huh. But um, in some orchestras, it gets up to 444, even 445. I've heard. Yes. But uh, yeah, the the uh, and also we have baroque orchestras which tune down maybe even to a 415 so it's quite a bit of difference where uh, if you go to a concert and you're hearing uh, a baroque ensemble that's playing traditional instruments they may be tuning down to 415 uh, and anywhere in between there and and 440 uh -huh. But uh, some of the major orchestras are tuning up above 440 because it makes the uh, sound a little bit brighter. Now, while they're all out there, maybe 100 musicians or more tuning up, where are you? I'm pacing backstage. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you out there saying, wait, wait a minute, that instrument right there, I didn't think well, you that's, quite... Well, that's interesting. That's, the, that's actually the job of the concertmaster, uh -huh. uh, who's the, the first violinist who's, who sits to the conductor's immediate left. Um, and hopefully you have an ensemble that is capable as individual players of making sure that their instruments are you know, meeting that criteria. Um, but uh, that, that job is, is delegated to the concertmaster and I'm backstage thinking of the opening tempo of the opening piece. Mm -hmm. so, Great. Yeah. Well, I have a million questions. I Great. really do. But we're going to open up the phone lines. We have a caller ready on the line. It's Nola from Allentown. Hello, you're on the air with yes, uh, Greg and Kim. Yes, good evening. Uh, my question is for the uh, panelists for the music. Which ancient civilization is known as the original musicians? That's it. <laughs> okay, well, that's... Which uh, ancient civilization is Yeah, known. Where, where do you... Uh, when, when you study music, I guess they tell you kind of where it, maybe it all got started somehow, but... You could blame the Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think the, at its most basic form, singing, uh, obviously, was the uh -huh. very first thing. Um, the first music that came along. Um, came from us, out yeah, of our own voices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, um, 
you know, with pitched instruments, I mean, Pythagoras was the one we use his theorems for, for tuning. Um, mm. And and now we're going to have to put our music history to work here. And, and what oh, would you well, say? Well, I think in, in, in all the ancient cultures, the, the string instruments were actually um, in ancient societies in China, yes. in Mongolia, and they used silk strings and they, um, they you know, people would use whatever they had to build these instruments. Um, I found uh, some instruments from Mongolia that were made with horsehair strings uh -huh. and horsehair bows, and they had a horsehair uh, head on, on the instrument. I was but, in, in Beijing recently uh -huh. at a museum with their antiques that go back hundreds, if not hundreds of years, if, if not much longer. And uh, there was a section on musical instruments in, mm -hmm. in the National Museum there. And indeed, it was mostly string instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we would think of as string instruments, although they were un very unusual kinds of materials right. that they some might have of, used. Some of the early instruments are, are zithers, which had, they're, they're like a keyboard almost. Mm -hmm. They have just a, 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 a set of strings. I don't know how many strings, maybe, you know, 30 or 40 strings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those were some of the earliest instruments. And uh, then, you know, they passed down the string uh, instruments just, uh, like the air hu is one of these very, very early Chinese instruments. And uh -huh. they still use the air hu today in the same format, uh, which is kind of an amazing, uh, amazing instrument. Let's take another call. Dick is on the line from Johnstown. Hi, Dick. Good evening, Dr. Spanier. Uh, I have a question for uh, Ms. Cook. Mm -hmm. I see on her uh, lapel she has a, uh, looks like, be a violin, I, I'm not sure, but I was wondering what a professor of music, or specifically uh, Ms. Cook, teaches her students. I would be curious, uh, is it that you teach them to play, or you teach them the history of music, or I imagine great there's question. a great deal to learn, and I would like to hear that, and thank you, folks. Uh, let me just say the lapel pin is closest in size to a violin, but Kim actually <laughs> plays the cello. So uh, you'd have to blow that up many times to get up to cello size. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, that's a good question um, about what we actually teach. Now, I'm teaching cello lessons, and I primarily teach individual lessons to the students. And so within those lessons, we're dealing with a number of different things. Uh, one is just how to play the instrument. So we call this uh, pedagogy, and that is working to make everything work so that you can draw the bow across the string and make the most beautiful sound possible. And then the left hand, we want it to work too and to play everything in tune at the time that we want it to. And so these are the tools that go into um, getting us to the point where we can be expressive with music. And then we take a piece of music and we have to find out about the history, we find, we find out what this music means to us and why we're playing it, and, uh, and then we go from there in trying to get it to a very, very high level so that we can present it. And Greg, in addition to your conducting, you run a music program for an entire high school. Is yeah, right? I have the uh, string program and it's the uh, Dairy Township School District. It's Hershey, Hershey, yeah. Pennsylvania. So it's the Hershey High School and Hershey Middle School. So do you have to know how to play a whole bunch of different kinds of well, instruments? Well, uh, with the string teaching, I am just limited to the, the string instruments. So violin was, in addition to piano, as you'd mentioned, violin was my specialty at, um, while here at Penn State. Um, and we did have methods so that uh, we could be able to teach the, the viola and the cello and the string bass as I well. I probably taught you string and, methods. And Kim did teach me <laughs> cello methods. In fact, just today I was sharing with a student. I said, you know, I'm going to see the, the lady who taught me how to teach you cello, <laughs> and I still can't get my hand the right way <laughs> because it still looks like I'm a violinist playing the cello. Uh, so, But I'll yeah, we, we do have to know all lesson. of Okay, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a call from uh, Dan, who's in Tyrone. Hi, Dan. Hi. I tuned in a little late. I heard uh, you talking about the orchestra tuning to the oboe's A, mm -hmm. but you said A hertz. What is a hertz? 440 hertz. What is a hertz? Or uh, hertz? The, the hertz, that's a, uh, a measurement of the frequency. That's yeah. right. Yeah. It's the frequency. The of number the of vibrations per minute. Number of vibrations per, per 
second per, per minute per second. second probably I think it is yeah. per second yeah right uh -huh. yeah and Paul from Andover New York hi Paul hi um, I understood you say that the orchestra is tuned to the oboe mm -hmm. I always heard that they had to be tuned to the piano because the piano was the largest instrument and harder to tune well that's a good point <laughs> because uh, if the piano is tuned to a certain pitch then we do have to tune up to that pitch. But that means that the oboist will tune to whatever the pitch of the piano is. If the piano is being presented in a concerto or something, uh, I mean, this is all determined much in advance. So uh -huh. if the piano were to be tuned at 442, then that's what the orchestra would be. So then the oboe would know to come in and give a different kind yeah, of... Yeah, usually right before uh, they would tune the rest of the orchestra as the players are milling about on stage, the oboist would go over and take the piano A, measure it on their tuner, uh -huh. and once they get that calibrated, as they sit down, then they would know to play that calibrated uh, pitch. But in a professional hall, you would be seeing um, the, the orchestra plays at a certain pitch level, and the piano is also tuned to that level, level so mm -hmm. there isn't much fluctuation in, you know, from concert to concert. Yeah, and you mentioned somewhere along the way that you were the page turner for a great musician. Yeah, Perlman. For Itzhak Itz Perlman, Itzhak Perlman, who performed recently here. Uh, here's a, a trivial question. Okay. When you're turning a page for someone, at what they know the music, obviously, do you turn the page a few notes beforehand <laughs> or right at that moment, you know, or that is, is everybody a, different? Everybody's different. That's uh -huh. a great question because the pianist at the time for Perlman was the late Sam Sanders, a brilliant uh, accompanist, and never really got uh, the recognition that he, he truly deserved. He was an accompanist who was uh, really a collaborator and yet totally out of Perlman's way. But he was a little bit neurotic, and we had a meeting before the concert, <laughs> and he had in colored pencils in his piano score uh -huh. exactly when I was to stand and exactly when I was to turn the page. Wow. Yeah, and so we had to go over this, and it was literally every piece, page by page, stand here, turn here. Well, that was kind of nice for me because there was no guessing. And mm -hmm. with some pianists, you have to guess. So I have to follow the music as a page turner as well as the pianists sure. are, are. Now, of course, they do know their music, but a lot of times it's they need to know what's coming next. So there is timing is of the essence when you're turning pages, and you could really blow some performances for some pianists if you're not careful. Uh -huh. so. We've had some situations where a page turner forgot to turn back in the repeat and... Yeah. and where they pull the score I mean, clear off the yeah. instrument. I mean, that happens too. <laughs> well, in, in this recent concert uh, where we had Emmanuel Axt and Yitzhak Perlman and Yo-Yo Ma, three of the great Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, musicians of our, of our time. Magicians as magicians well. Magicians of, of, well. of, of music. Um, uh, I was reminded of, of something that you wrote about in one of your columns this year about when to clap mm -hmm. and when not to uh, uh, applaud. And, uh, you know, you in your very gracious way were saying, look, any good musician is happy to have applause at any time because it expresses appreciation. But I think it might bother some people. And in this recent concert, the audience, I think, was inappropriately applauding well, at a couple of points. And I, 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 it looked to me like Yo-Yo Ma was happy about it and didn't really care. <laughs> but Yitzhak Perlman put his hand up at one point mm -hmm. as to say to the audience, no, not, not now. Mm -hmm. Well, but also I, uh, I heard the interview with Emmanuel Axe, uh -huh. and he did tell the audience that he, they right. should clap whenever ahead, they wanted all, to. Right. Go ahead. Just what I said in yeah. my column, but it, it, it isn't really um, being specific enough because there are times when you want to hear the silence at the end of the movement. And so if you can he wait just for the silence to see, to let the mood dissipate, mm. then that, you know, guarantees that you won't be interrupting, you know, someone else's well, mood. Moment. And yeah. many times it's the people in the audience that are more. So, Greg, just upset. for the record, when do you applaud and when do you want to wait? And well, how can an audience, I, who is an audience member who isn't sophisticated in classical music, tell? I always, uh, even as an audience goer, I will sometimes 
be a little unsure of when to applaud. So uh, the, the safety rule is I wait until the guy next to me starts. <laughs> but if you don't want to do that, um, the basic rule is in a multi-movement work, uh -huh. uh, such as a symphony, uh, you would wait until the end of the last movement. Mm -hmm. um, if you're still unsure, wait until the conductor puts his or her arms down and, and turns to the orchestra as if to say, you know, okay, that was that was great. We're mm -hmm. we're done now. Um, but that, those are the two so you can, most basic I mean, rules. I count and I see. Okay, there's four move. This is a piece I haven't heard before. I right. see there's four movements. Sometimes I'm you get lost. Kind of making a note. Well, yeah. that's the fourth. Now it. Yeah. Sorry. Now we clap. And that mm -hmm. and and sometimes audiences are um, just over excited. They can't uh -huh. they can't help but burst into applause. Yeah. When I mean, you see this on concerts on YouTube all the time, uh, Argerich, a great pianist of our time, will finish the first movement of a concerto and the audience will just spontaneous applause and what do you do how do you tell them not to yeah. enjoy themselves as a conductor so. does it bother you ever no um, I feel badly for either the musicians on stage who are in that in that moment as Kim said mm -hmm. or the other audience members who are in that moment um, I feel badly for them it doesn't bother me it used to bother me I used to be a little hoity-toity about it but uh -huh. now I, I realize that it's coming from a good place yes you know right so. Uh, Jake from State College, thanks for calling into our program tonight. If you'd like to make a call. Uh, Didn't get that one. I, yeah, we missed Jake. Let's uh, try Jay from State College, who's next in the queue there. Hi, Jay. Hello, Dr. Spanier. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two related questions. Um, one of your two guests. Why is it that some people can be self-taught, can pick up an instrument and learn it on their own? And of you, Dr. Spanier, are you self-taught in percussion? Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I've never had a lesson in percussion. I am very much self-taught. I'll tell you how I started playing percussion is uh, somebody pulled me out of an audience for fun, the Dixieland Jazz Band, and uh, put a washboard in my hand and said, you know, play along with us. So I got up there and played, and I played. And afterwards said, you really have rhythm. You can play. And they started calling me up and saying, we're going to play at such and such a place. Would you come and play with us? And after a few months of this, I just was made a member of the band. And so uh, I kind of picked it up on my own. And you know, now I spend a lot of time with it and play with some different bands. And, uh, and you know, I'm not very well schooled in it, unlike these two folks. <laughs> who are very well schooled and I'm sure among your students there are some who just get it and some for whom it's more of a struggle. So I think it's a great question for you guys. Well, yeah, uh, I mean it, different students have different talents and so uh, I think some people, I think the most important area here would be listening. If people have listened to this music quite a lot then usually you find that, that uh, if you want to produce a certain sound, you'll find a way to produce it. Mm -hmm. And uh, working with a teacher can help you to find out the easiest way to do that and the you know most economical way as far as your your movements go. But um, if you're if you're hearing a sound that you really want to produce, then then you will find a way to do that. Uh, I'm reading a book right now called The Element by. Sir Kent Robinson, and he is discussing um, the number of ways that we measure intelligence. And unfortunately, uh, his point is that in in public schools right now, we are not we are only measuring two very specific types of intelligences. But music is one of them. That that we're, well, we're not measuring that, but music is one of the intelligences. And um, some people are just like like you said, that is where they can excel. Um, I have some students who. Uh, maybe aren't the greatest scholars, uh, but you put an instrument in their hand and, and it's like a fish in water. Mm -hmm. So I think that some people do have a, a natural predilection or um, you know, natural aptitude that for them that is where their intelligence lies. It's, it's always seemed to me that it requires a certain kind of brilliance in the same way you might think of um, a mathematician, a PhD level mathematician being brilliant. Uh, someone who's been very close to our family, in fact, who has a couple of degrees from Penn State, but also a doctoral degree in music from another university and is now a professor of music uh, at another university. Uh, I, I would go to her performances and she would be able to play at 
concert piano for half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm thinking she's not only playing in the course of that time thousands of notes that she has memorized, literally thousands of notes, yeah. but with each note, a certain degree of pacing, the rhythm, the pedals, the the emotion, it what kind of a brain does it take to remember all of that? To me, that that's that's truly remarkable. Well, there are there are a lot of things that go into playing, but I think you know we we tend to break it down, and so that w when you're hearing the final performance, you're hearing many years yeah. of of preparation, and it's just like if you get up and and say a speech, you know you've practiced that for many you know many weeks or something, and uh, with the music, it, it is something that you you learn in steps, but it does take a lot of different uh, areas of, of, say, skill. I think you're you're deciphering the music, you're using your physical body, and you're you're researching the history. So there are a lot of different different things involved in mm -hmm. interpreting music. Well, if you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is music appreciation with guests Kim Cook, Penn State professor of music, and Greg Woodbridge, music director and conductor of the Central Pennsylvania Symphony. You can join the conversation by calling us at 1-800-543-8242, or email us at response at psu.edu. Now, a little before the show, you two were in the studio and you recorded a little piece, which I'd like to have us play for folks now. Uh, would one of you like to say a little bit about the piece before we listen to it? Sure. This is a piece by Saint-Saëns, French composer, mm -hmm. and this is a part of a, a larger piece called Carnival of the Animals, and this is the swan. And ah. he's the water, yes. and I'm depicting the swan with the cello. I didn't know that that was the piece you recorded, but mm -hmm. you may not know that I was the narrator oh, for this piece with the Penn State's Orchestra a couple of years yeah. back. Uh -huh. It was one of my great music experiences. Uh -huh. So now I'm really <laughs> excited to watch it. So let's take a listen, then we'll come back and talk about it.
Bravo, Encore. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. See, now, I watched that. I just loved watching that, enjoying it. Now, when you're watching it, are you thinking, oh, I could have done that a little differently, or that might have been better, or too slow, or too, or are you just enjoying it at this point? What, what do you, when you watch something that you've done like that, what goes through <laughs> your mind? Yeah, it's always hard to watch because, um, yeah, we're evaluating constantly, but I can enjoy the music too. Uh huh. Yeah. How about you? Oh, I love watching Kim play. So I focus. I focus <laughs> so you're focusing focus on, her. on that, yeah. Uh huh. But yeah, it's it's true. I mean, you you never stop that evaluation process. We were just talking in the green room. Kim just recently did some uh, recording work in Russia, and yeah. I was asking her about that process. You know, does it ever get easy uh -huh. to be in the recording studio? And because you you do that, and I'm learning as I'm as I'm maturing. Um, to let go of some of that and to really, like Kim said, really try to enjoy the music. Uh -huh. So I have that CD, uh -huh. uh, Shostakovich. That's and, right. And uh, how did that come about? Um, actually, I was invited by a conductor to play these two concertos, the Shostakovich and the Tchaikovsky, uh, on the same concert. And it, it's kind of like a marathon concert for a cellist because it's, they're very, both very difficult works. And so, um, I did that concert and it went went well. So I, um, I he had suggested this orchestra that he'd worked with in in Russia, and um, after some communication, they invited me to come there and and uh, and record with them. Which uh, I just it was an incredible opportunity for me because mm -hmm. the conductor was Edward Serov, who had worked as an assistant to the conductor in Leningrad. Um, when they did all these premieres of Shostakovich. So for me it was really a, an amazing experience to get to work with them for two weeks and to play a concert of this music and also to record it. It was a learning experience. We're, um, we have callers and, Good. and here's, a, here's an email I just want to get to real fast. Perfect pitch. What is it? Who has it? Can it be learned? Good question. Oh. Perfect pitch. You're going to throw this to we, me, aren't you? Oh, no, I'll take it. <laughs> Good. Perfect pitch is when you can recognize immediately what uh, what a note, the pitch of the note yeah. is. So when you hear a pitch, you'll say, okay, that's an A. Uh -huh. And uh, if someone, you know, so this makes actually, this makes our ear training course. Yeah. Well, so do you have it? Actually, I don't. We have relative pitch. Most all musicians have relative pitch, which is... What? You, how about you, Greg? Yeah, rel no, relative pitch. Yeah, uh -huh. I, And people that do have perfect pitch, um, it can end up being more trouble than... than uh, than well, because it drives me crazy that yeah, something's if something not quite as it matches up with what's Yeah, this is where exactly. the 440 and the 444 oh, oh, and the 415, it can really uh, wreak uh -huh. havoc on your uh, sensibility if you're and trying then, to... And then within a chord, as something is tuned, it's not always, um, you know, depending on where the note falls in the chord yeah. and what the job of that note is in that chord, it's not going to be... 440, you know, yeah. sometimes it has to sag a little or it has to be a little bit brighter. Mm -hmm. um, and also as, as uh, people get tired too, their perfect pitch can end up sagging. So they can, you know, at the end of a long day, mm -hmm. what they consider to be perfect really isn't. So Interesting. It can be difficult. Let's take a couple of calls here. Uh, Rosa has been on the line patiently waiting, calling from Hershey. Hi, Rosa. Hi. Uh, I have a question about tone deafness. I'm not quite sure. Uh, what that means. Uh -huh. uh, would you uh, te have a child who's tone deaf learn an instrument or can you get over tone deafness or is it something that stays with you all your life? Yeah. I that's mean, that's right. some kids insult their little brothers and sisters saying, well, you're tone deaf. But <laughs> is, is it a real thing? Uh, it, it, is, it is not. No, no one is tone deaf. Uh -huh. You can learn uh, to overcome that. It, what tone deafness is, is basically you haven't been trained to be able to match that pitch or to hear that pitch in, in a way. Now obviously if you are uh, a student um, and you're learning music prior to the age of seven, um, that will go away, which is one of the reasons why music education is so important in our schools right now. And I would say that um, rather than learning an instrument, the best way to overcome that or to prevent that is singing, mm. first and foremost. Um, and then secondly, I would say for myself, um, 
I was a pianist first before I was a violinist. And I think that uh, having your hands play a note that you know is going to be correct, that that is in fact a G um, versus on a string instrument where you have to sort of figure it out at first, mm -hmm. um, that helps. But I think, I think singing is, is the best preventative mm -hmm. for tone deafness. And Good. it can be overcome. Tom, yeah. Tom from Punxsutawney, you're on the air. Hi, Dr. Spanier. Hi. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Hey, as a uh, homeschool parent that uh, I'm trying to raise some string students, uh, we're always looking for opportunities for our children. And I know the Junior Baroque Workshop was canceled this year down there at State College. Are there other opportunities on campus uh, throughout the summer for teens and, and other youth? Mm -hmm. um, well, we do have a Penn State music camp, which has a, an orchestra and a band and a choir. So uh, that is just a short, uh, a short camp, though it's it's about a week long. And other than that, we do have the Penn's Woods Festival, which uh, just for for listening, I think one of the the first things I suggest for for children and and uh, even older older children is to, to go to concerts and so we will have some concerts and actually the music department there's there are always concerts going on so you might get onto our website to to take a look and and see what what is going on here's a common question from parents when do i start my kids with music lessons do i have them start to play the piano at four or five or eight or is 12 too late what what do you advise well, uh, I advise the earlier the better, uh -huh. uh, obviously, and it's going to differ. If you have a child uh, who is capable of, of sitting and paying attention and you're willing to work with them for you know, a length of, of a practice session and they're four years old, then, then that's great. Start them when they're four. Some uh, students start as young as, as three and they thrive. There's also physical um, characteristics that you want to be uh, careful of. You want to make sure that they are comfortable with the instrument and that they're not um, going to injure themselves in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and I have had success with students who have started at the age of 12. You know, we, we go back to that comment about musical intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, there was a student at Penn State that I was uh, colleagues with who began the piano when he was in high school and is now, um, I don't know what he's doing right now, but I know that he was very, very successful and won all sorts of but awards. Normally high school would be on the late side. High school would be I'm on hearing. the late side yeah. if, you mm -hmm. were, if you were to get a career. But as far as, you know, we're talking about music appreciation and the ability to make music and make it a part of your yeah. life at, at that level, then, you know, What about something like late. the bassoon? Now, Daryl, our right. bassoon professor, kindly gave me a lesson because I was fascinated <laughs> with the bassoon <laughs> and you know he said I will have you playing in in the first lesson and you know about 45 minutes into it I couldn't get a sound out of it I was beginning to doubt that <laughs> but he did play a duet with me at the end so I knew it was possible but I was sore for two days afterwards yeah. because oh, yeah. the bassoon weighs a ton and it's mm -hmm. really big and you have to sit on a strap to hold it up and help you with right. the weight and it's very peculiar in terms of you know getting your arms it. around it and so on. So, I don't think you could be five or even twelve. I would think <laughs> no, and that, play the bassoon. That, you, that is one of those instances where you would learn a, a similar instrument. In other words, another double reed instrument. Ah. And then you would switch learn to the that. Learn the basics of an yeah. instrument you can handle, and then work your and way then, into and it. then work your way into it. And it is a very complicated instrument. And Professor Duran does a phenomenal job of making it look easy to play, but it is not. <laughs> and and uh, he he makes that thing sing. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that if you're starting as an older um, adult, that there are instruments that you can, you can use to learn. One is the recorder, um, and that's a very inexpensive instrument, and you can get books that tell you how to read music, and, and this is a nice way to kind of introduce yourself to the process. And then once you get uh, a little bit of skill on an instrument like that, you could go ahead and, and try one of the other instruments. And, and you know, then you have to use just a few minutes a day getting used to the, the hold and <laughs> the physical aspect. Hey, Walter, thanks for calling tonight. Walter from Warren. Mr. President Spanier, thank you for taking my call. You bet. Uh, the uh, reason I'm calling is uh, a, a common and uh, it's a, a sort of a pedestrian question, and it has to do with the filthy lucre. 
I mean, classical music is wonderful, but it costs money. Mm -hmm. And where does that money come from? Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what Professors Cook and Woodbridge have to say about where does it come from, where should it come from, um, who, who should be supporting classical music, music appreciation. The school budgets, they're cutting back uh, in the uh, secondary and elementary schools across the state. Uh, the federal government is taking less and less of a role in the support of its orchestras and its uh, public radio stations. And yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear what uh, some people who are directly involved with the uh, situation have to say. I think it's, it's a very important topic. Mm -hmm. We hear about this a lot now. You know, mm -hmm. budgets are tight, and the first thing people want to get rid of is music. That's right. I think um, administrators like you, President Spanier, are, are in a position where you can highlight the arts and what we do, and, and that's very important. We... You know, we need leaders that believe in music, um, but it's always a problem to be able to pay for, for what we're doing. Uh, on the other hand, um, for example, the Penn State Music Department offers 350 concerts a year at no charge. So for an audience member, I mean, even though some of the concerts at the Penn State, uh, at the Center for Performing Arts may be quite expensive, um, in the community, you can usually access some kind of music for, for not too much money. And then again, with uh, expenses for, for lessons and the instruments, I think we have to be very, very creative about how we go about that. Um, we borrow instruments or we, um, many times students will teach for, for not too much. And, and so, the problem is there's, well, not a problem, that we have so many people that want to play and want to, to do music, mm -hmm. and so... Um, but Greg, now, you are conductor of an, of an orchestra. Yeah. How does that orchestra get supported? How do they pay you? I mean, uh, well, it's, it's tricky, and, and you know, the, the larger orchestras, uh, the professional orchestras, are seeing their endowments down this year by 26% alone. Yeah. Um, and it was just recently released, I think it's St. Paul, I, I may be misspeaking, that is the players have actually agreed to a salary reduction mm -hmm. so that they can continue playing um, versus, you know, just losing their jobs entirely. Now, in my situation, it's a lot different because we're much smaller scale. Obviously, we're a community orchestra. Um, but we have seen our funding from local businesses and, and contributions from individual members go down, you know, because of the way that the economy is. So we had some things in place um, that enabled us to sort of ride this out. Um, but it is, it's not something that, that even orchestras at the community level take lightly. Yeah. So. Patty, uh, Patty from Altoona, thanks yeah. for calling our program tonight. Uh -huh. You're, Hello. Hi, you're on the air, Patty. Okay, I yeah. have a question uh -huh. for the gentleman okay. on the program. Uh, I was asked by an um, uh, individual over the weekend. I went to see the Altoona Symphony and our director, Teresa Chang, and she wanted to, uh, this person asked me, why don't they face the audience? And I came back, get her with, well, why? She has to conduct the full orchestra. Why would she face the audience? Right. Well, we want to see more of her. <laughs> and I said, well, that would be difficult yes. <laughs> for her to cue to do her job. And, you know. <laughs> or she could conduct from the back and have the musicians all facing the other direction. Well, in interestingly <laughs> enough, uh, in, in, in um, I think it was the 1800s, the conductors would face the audience uh, in oh. the pit orchestras uh, for operas. They would stand at the back of the pit with their backs to the stage and facing the pit orchestra. So in, in those times, uh, the audience was able to see the conductor. I myself, when I have the opportunity, like to buy the seats uh, at the Baltimore Symphony or the Philadelphia Orchestra where you, in fact, are seated behind the orchestra so that you can watch the conductor. For me, that's, it's like taking a course in conducting. Um, but the next best thing, unfortunately, um, if you can't see them live from that angle, um, luckily we have DVDs and we have YouTube and uh, a lot of resources that do allow you to see that. But your friend is right because that angle is where all of the magic happens between a conductor and an orchestra. 
and we do miss that as an audience just mm -hmm. staring at their backs and and what you miss um, by not seeing them from the front is the first of all the energy you're missing the facial expressions and you're you're missing the very specific gestures that are evoking musical sounds from the symphony so uh, your friend is right i agree that that is a much more interesting view of the conductor than than merely watching them from the back well, maybe there's a compromise some some um uh, 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 venues have these uh, seats kind right. of up around the edges where you can you're looking at an angle yeah. and maybe I, and those are the ones that I both. like and I like to try to get the conductors to to look up <laughs> and let them know that their work isn't unnoticed <laughs> yeah right or you know multimedia also uh, if you had cameras set up during the concert with the you know big screens like uh -huh. they do in, in pops concerts oh. we're not too far away from that sort of thing interesting yeah. Ron's calling from Johnstown hi Ron. Uh, good uh, good evening, President Spamini, and I'm 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 happy to talk to all of you on this because I'll be 59 in July, and music's always been a big part of my life. When I was in seventh grade in Joe Johns Junior High School in Johnstown, uh, Mr. Cole Porter Huntington, uh, there's a name for you, mm -hmm. got me involved in the band, and I absolutely loved it, and I played trombone, and I worked my way from third chair trombone up to second chair, first chair second trombone. Until uh, I got to 10th grade, but when I got to 10th grade, I got in what we started up called the stage band, the dance band. This is what I love, big band music that you don't hear anymore. It was such a wonderful time in U.S. history. The women were dressed in beautiful dresses. The men were in nice suits with top hats. Everything was so nice. The music was great. It was just a nice time. You don't hear that anymore, but I've always said... And I, I mean, you three might agree with me. If you can get a child to play a musical instrument, which is hard, and read music, there's no reason they can't do well in school. Because it's like reading hieroglyphics, that stuff. There's mm -hmm. nothing there but those notes, and you have to know. Well, it's, great. it's great for the mind. Uh, there's a, a physical aspect to it. You have to practice, so it, the, discipline, so the that, discipline that comes yeah. there must carry over. And the academics right. for, for a lot of people. You can't hide with music because at some point you have to play and you know if you're not doing it every day, you can't pull an all-nighter uh -huh. for a concert. You, you <laughs> have to practice every day and so it, it is a, a more of a lifestyle um, that you're learning, learning the discipline and how to approach something. Uh -huh. And you can keep it through your life. The, the last caller mentioned um, that he was really interested in swing bands and, and they do exist um, in and around the Harrisburg area. There are a few community swing bands, a big band type of, of things. We ourselves with the Central Pennsylvania Symphony, we do a, a big band concert, a, a pops concert once a year around Valentine's Day. And um, there are a lot of bands that are springing up uh, throughout the nation. They're called second chance bands, where people that had been students of music throughout mm -hmm. their middle school or high school career are coming back to it as adults. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful. Just a couple of uh, technical things uh, put you all on the spot here. The difference between a sonata and a concerto. Well, a concerto is a soloist accompanied by an orchestra, usually. And uh, so the concerto may have two or three movements. Well, actually, usually it has three movements, faster movement, slower movement, and then faster. And so this can be uh, generally for a violin or a piano, sometimes cello. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but this is the kind of composition it is, always accompanied by an orchestra. A sonata, on the other hand, so, sonata is uh, from the word sonare, which is to uh, sound. And so it's, it's kind of a term that loosely mm -hmm. defines any piece of music, although it's usually, uh, it is, a, a, say, a, a piece of music for an instrument with accompaniment. And um, it may have three or four movements. And say okay. a cello sonata would have, you know, Allegro, then adagio, then maybe a minuet movement or a scherzo movement, and then another allegro. Okay, how about the difference between a symphony and a philharmonic? No difference. No difference. Mm -mm. They're synonymous. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or a philharmonic orchestra. Yeah, and or a, a symphony and, orchestra. And a cha <laughs> what constitutes a chamber orchestra? Um, chamber orchestra, loosely defined, um, woodwinds with strings, no low brass. 
Now, they'll, they'll have trumpets and they'll have French horns, mm -hmm. but they won't have trombones, tuba, and a, a lot of percussion. They'll have maybe timpani. Mm -hmm. so and are all orchestra. of these rules pretty clear, or is it a little fuzzy around the edges? What's called what and... The, it's pretty clear. Uh -huh. uh, with some contemporary compositions, it can get a little fuzzy. Um, chamber usually refers to small, so you can have um, a contemporary composition that would be considered a chamber-sized orchestra, mm -hmm. but would include maybe one trombone, a slew of percussion, and a cello and a violin, you know, and they would call it a, a chamber work, mm -hmm. you know. But um, generally speaking, it's winds and strings. I think we have a time for a quick question from Emily, who's calling from State College. Hi, Emily. Hi, I'll try to make it very short. It's a twofold question, please. Uh, the first one is um, music appreciation is uh, taught to small children. When you go to a concert and you sit in the audience and you look around, you generally find for classical music adults 60 and up. Yeah. There's a wide swath in between who don't seem to know that classical music is uh, for the 40s and 50s also. The second question is, um, in this downturn in economy uh, and jobs being lost all the time, uh, how can one tell young people to have a income-producing career in music when uh, your average town doesn't even have a chamber orchestra? Mm. It's just something that's sort of like so up out there that's not worthy of income kind of uh, perception, in Glenn, my opinion. Glenn let's, let's delve into the answer because our time will be kind of short on this. What about the age demographics of who goes to listen to classical music? I, I think she's on to something there because... Uh, that it's the younger children and the older audiences? It's, it's, the audiences seem older to me. Uh -huh. uh, and then maybe some bring children along. I think a but. lot of times when people are in their 40s and 50s, they are so overwhelmed with, uh, uh -huh. I mean, many are raising children and they have their, their jobs are very, very um, busy. And then they may uh, become a little bit less busy when they're in their 60s. And so, you know, we, we'd like it to be more accessible for, for everyone to be able to experience concerts. Many times people experience it with their children and they'll, they'll be taking them to concerts and so they'll get, get this uh, exposure. Uh, but we do want to attract you know, all audiences, so I'm not sure what the, the answer to that is. Mm -hmm. Orchestras are, are, are working very hard to attract that missing link. Yeah. Um, New York Philharmonic started a series a number of years ago where they do concerts at 5.30, so the commuters leaving town can, right. can go and, and, oh. and see the symphony. Um, and the we see more and more programs directed at young people to get them yes. interested. There's lots of children's programs, but I wish we could get more of our college students to come to some of these musical offerings. Well, um, you do have the financial aspects mm -hmm. also, but um, Somebody like Marin Alsop with the Baltimore Symphony has been very creative with, with her programming and she talks about maximizing the experience for the concert goer where she will not only, uh, last year she not only performed a, a concert of all Beethoven, but she had people from Johns Hopkins Medical Center come and do an autopsy on how it was that Beethoven died. So she did this whole presentation on, <laughs> wow. because they had just unearthed, no pun intended, some new evidence about um, the possibility of Beethoven having been poisoned or, or, or died from uh, metal poisoning of some right. sort. And so she had doctors come and actually do a presentation and that pulled in a whole different kind of an audience that would have otherwise gone just to hear Beethoven. And so maybe um, our jobs as musicians is to do what she's doing, which is to maximize that experience to try to get that demographic. I want to thank you both very much for being on our program tonight. What a fast, I think we've just scratched the surface. We'll Absolutely. have to do a, yeah. another show on this at, uh, at some point. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. Thank you to our guests tonight, Kim Cook, professor of music at Penn State, and Greg Woodbridge, music director and conductor of the Central Pennsylvania Symphony. Uh, thank you both. We thank appreciate you for it. Us. And thanks to you for watching. We hope you'll join us again on Tuesday, May 26th, 
when our topic will be head and neck cancer, very different kind of topic. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Graham Spanier. Have a good night. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.